Hello, welcome to A Story in a Song with Deborah Cohen in beautiful Florida, USA. And today we're going to talk about a topic that I have learned innately to do. It's called shuckling. You may have seen certain Jews that when they pray, I even do it when I start talking. It's the spirit inside of the person that is causing the movement. It's nothing that I plan like choreography to do. It just happens as a natural response to prayer. So if you're curious about this, and actually I was doing this before I converted to Judaism. So this is for Christians as well or anybody curious about prayer. If you are, find the next 30 minutes in a place where you can listen without distraction. Bring a paper and pen and take some notes and listen. And I'll be right back after this message. Hello, this is Deborah Cohen, Deborah Cohen Music, and I'm so glad that you took the time to listen to my podcast, A Story and a Song. It's about my life to share some wisdom and some mistakes, hopefully that we can learn from together and laugh at maybe, starting in the 80s in a new wave rock band in Boston with two singles that are still available on Spotify. Boston Nights and Dreamin'. And then on my worldly journey that we're all on, I morphed into a spiritually dominant being where I am a truth seeker and write songs of praise while having one foot in the world writing sync music. So listen up and share. And this is Deborah Cohen. I'm glad you're with me. I broadcast on Instagram. I see Kim James is in the house on Instagram. My handle is Deborah Cohen Music. Dot D O T C O M. Or on my YouTube channel live, the handle is at Jewish Rock Music. So if this interests you, I hope it does. This is something that is a movement that some people do when they pray. Now, let me start by telling you how I first started shuckling. I was not Jewish, I was Christian. And I would join the various choirs in these Pentecostal churches. And when I start singing, you know, sheet music in hand, I start moving back and forth. It's not like I plan on it. It just happens when I'm praying. And this one particular place I was praying as a soprano singing, of course, we had the fancy Bach movements and all around my singing. And uh, Betsy was the star singer beside me. And I was standing beside her singing my part. And uh, she says to me, (laughs) <laughs> while we're performing, stop doing that. You're distracting me. And I'm like, get over yourself, woman. You know, but this is what some churches or most churches, when they sing, uh, that's why I call it round mouth singing. And please don't be offended. This is just me talking. I mean, you know, you get up there, you stand like a stiff and, oh, oh doesn't she have a beautiful voice? Is that all it is, though? A beautiful voice? I hope it's more than that. It's a transformation if you understand why you are singing to God, hopefully, and not because you want people to praise you, heaven forbid. So there I thought, well, I guess I don't fit there anymore. So for a while, I joined a black uh, church, black American church. I fit right in. You know, they just get up there in the choir and they move and they... Shout to the pastor, respectfully, of course, with their support of his sermon. And so I was promoted to a choir leader of a uh, what was it, Cumberland Presbyterian 
church in Tennessee. And I was, there was only two white people in the church and I was one of them. And I was the leader of the choir. And we had a glorious time. And nobody ever told me that I couldn't move this way or that. And I would, nobody ever said, Deborah, you're too loud. But that was all about to change because you know what? When you're on this planet called Earth, we're here to grow just like nature. You know, Earth, we bloom and grow. There's a season for everything. We change. If you're the same person that you were since the last time you went into a place of worship in a congregation and you haven't had any growth, then maybe you need to change where you're going. And Adi Kor Dova is in the house. Thank you for joining me. That we're talking about different kinds of movement in prayer. And I'm sharing my journey because, you know, a lot of people end up searching aimlessly for why they're here on earth. And I'm just sharing what I've come across because maybe it'll be helpful. So we start out um, moving, pr moving. I'm, I'm doing a recap. First, I was in a Pentecostal choir. I was swaying in the choir, and it bothered the lead soprano because she said I was distracting her. So I moved on. You don't stay where you're not welcome. I'm not saying that you leave with every insult that is thrown at you, but it just fit. You know, if I can't grow because I have to stand there when I'm singing instead of move, I move when I sing. I've always done that. Okay, so that I move on and I become a choir leader of an all-black church, African-American. And it's okay for me to move in that church. And I can belt it out and praise God with all my might because everybody else is for the most part. But then, of course, I felt like I needed to move on and I went to Israel. And that's where I discovered that Jesus was or a Jew. I'm like, I never heard that in my entire Christian Catholic life. I never heard that Jesus was a Jew. Never heard that the disciples were Jewish. Never heard that the Old Testament is Jewish. Oh, I never heard it until I went to Israel in 99. So then I came back on this quest to, to study the book that Jesus taught that Christians don't learn because they were told that Jesus taught the Torah when he was on earth, but after he died, that book was canceled out by a book called the Brit Chadashah, the New Testament, that was written 60 years later by his disciples. <laughs> Seriously, I started questioning. If you ask a lot of questions, you get in trouble. I'll tell you that much. So anyway, I thought it, I need to study the Torah because that's what Jesus taught. Which, of course, what did it lead me to? What kind of congregation? If you said Judaism, you're right. And it wasn't easy because I had this guilt trip going on about leaving Jesus behind. I'm going to go to hell. Well, you know, I'm not trying to convert anybody. But if you're leaving the church or wherever you are worshiping, don't leave God. It's not, you're not discouraged with God per se, it's the doctrines of men that even Jesus warned people about. If you're in a church just because you have to be, because you were born into Catholicism like I was, but you can't, you're always looking at the clock, you can't wait to sneak out after communion. <laughs> you know, you need to pray to God and ask God, where, where can you go? And I'll tell you, I grew up in New England, so it's there's not much of a choice. Maybe it's changed since I left in the 90s. But if you're in Catholicism, it, you know, it's really hard to break into something else. <clears throat> so I had to move down south. And I'm in Florida now. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next trip uh, after going to Israel led me to study the Torah and over my music started to change and you can tell I have a discography Deborah Cohen music.com and I started out writing Christian music in 2000 well actually in 94 when I was in Nashville 
I'm jumping ahead a little bit. But then, um, you know, the day job got in the way, and that's another story. 2008, I start record recording myself after I learn how to do my own recording in my own recording studio, because at the time I was a public school teacher, and I couldn't afford to pay an engineer to, to mix and master my song, so I had to learn to do it myself. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Then I start going to synagogues, and, you know, before I got into Judaism, I used to think all Jews are the same, and a lot of Jews do that of Christians. They think all Christians are the same. That's absolutely called stereotyping. You have to still sift through the, the denominations and find which one fits for you. And I uh, try to reform synagogue, but it was too... Uh, secular for me and uh, so I went to let's see I think conservative there might have been one in between but it slips my mind so conservative synagogue and I start learning how to pray the prayers in Hebrew and I'm still learning and here comes that movement again and it, it wasn't the same kind of movement that I had with uh, the Pentecostal choir, which was just side to side, and it wasn't the same movement that I had when I was singing in the black church, which was more like a, a groove, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, it was, it's more like going within, meditation within, and some, and singing and rocking. And I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, this is called in Yiddish shuckling. Now, I did not learn to do this. It, it's the spirit inside of me that moves me when I pray and sing to God. Um, anybody can do it. I didn't. You don't go to school to learn how to do it. But I want to tell you why we do it. That's what I'm getting to. I just wanted to give you some context. I'm like, why am I doing this? I shuckle front to back, and then sometimes side to side. And I had somebody in the synagogue recently say, maybe I should learn to move like you do. And I'm like, what? I didn't, you don't learn to do this. You can learn why you do it, but the, you don't learn how to do it. There's no, nobody's going to teach you how to shuckle. It comes from the spirit within. Everybody has a spirit within. You have to tune into your own spirit. There's, um, anyway, I'm not going to get into Kassidism because that's off topic. So let me just share something from this book. One of my favorite rabbis, Zalman Shachter Shalomi. And uh, this book, you can find it on Amazon. Davening, a guide to meaningful Jewish prayer. And as I mentioned, even if you're not Jewish, there's some things in this book that are very insightful if you're on a spiritual path. Now, a lot of Jews, surprisingly enough, they don't welcome spirituality uh, because it, it's foreign to them. And it's just from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu at Mount Sinai, when everybody heard the voice of God and said, I will do what you say, God, to more like secular stuff going on today, and a lot of the prayers have been changed from that time. But thank goodness God never leaves us or forsakes us, even when we take a detour, which I've done many times. And So let's talk about this book. Here's an excerpt just to whet your uh, appetite for davening. When he realized, and I assume uh, this guy's talking about Judaism on the way we pray. When he realized that many American Jews were unlikely to master enough Hebrew to pray in the holy language, Rabbi Zalman taught us how to mumble or daven in English. Zalman also began calling out page numbers and other dramaturgical instructions in sing-song English so as not to interrupt the flow of prayers. Now, maybe you're wondering, wait a minute, why is this rabbi teaching Jews English when they pray, when it's supposed to be in Hebrew? Well, because he said there's a lot of Jews that don't know Hebrew. 
And so what happens is they don't participate. So Rabbi Zalman created this English praying that has to be implemented in the congregation that you're in, meaning the rabbi has to approve. Now, when I was at this other synagogue a couple years ago, before I started praying in Hebrew, I was in fact praying English from their Sidor, which is a, the, the prayer book they use in the service, praising God in the language that's written in the Sidor and praying out loud in English, but see, the rabbi hadn't approved it. That, I just did it because I, I have a relationship with God that wants me to pray out loud, not mumble or not say it to myself, but say it out loud. Okay, but not so loud. I'm distracting everybody else. But this particular uh, congregation that I was at, the rabbi's fiance heard me saying these words in English that highly offended her. And the irony is the words I was praying are in the Siddur that we're praying from, the prayer book. So I get called into a meeting, and she gets her rabbi, fiancé, and her to tell me what words I cannot say in English because they sound Christianese. I'm like, I was so hurt. I thought, wait a minute, I'm confused. And she wouldn't let up. She was like, okay. She had to have a Zoom meeting with me and tell me which words are forbidden. And I'm trying to say, well, these words are in our prayer book. Why can't? I don't understand why you think they're Christian. Uh, anyway, I had to take it to the lead rabbi, and it just got so ugly that I had to unfortunately leave that synagogue. It was so awful to go through that. But the, the beauty in it is, you know, if you're being pushed against a wall and you just are being stifled in a bad way to pursue your own goodness according to what you believe is good, God is good, amen, then as much as it hurts to leave, you have to make a choice because some people, they get stifled, stunted, and they stop growing and they lose their joy and it just becomes a, a, a duty and you're half dead spiritually. So it, even though at that time it was crushing Cry, very, I mean, crying, tears, depression, the whole nine yards. But the beauty of all that suffering is that my husband and I are now in an amazing synagogue in Florida. And these rabbis, there's no jealousy from the rabbis. See, the problem was jealousy. The, the rabbi's fiance in Georgia was extremely jealous of me and it's such a joke because I'm old enough to be her mother. So I have to pray for her, forgive her, move on. And God is blessing me for saying when you're backed against the wall, okay, I don't understand this, God, but I believe you're, you're trying to move me someplace else and I'm going to believe in you. So you don't do it on a whim. You pray about it. You you work through it. You travail with tears and you try to figure out, okay, where where is the light that I need to follow? And the light for my husband and I was first at another synagogue in Georgia that didn't work. And finally, we just found somebody online and became a member of the synagogue online for a while and then made the plunge and decided to physically move there so we could be a part of the, the family. It's important to be a part of a group, a family. So, you know, I don't know, it's not easy. So then the rabbi reminded us that, that cacophony, even in English, is authentically Jewish. This is, we're talking about praying, shuckling. Back in the 70s, Rabbi Zalman realized that under a strobe light, now this is really funny, under a strobe light, all actions appear jerky. Now we're talking about shuckling, right? I'm, I'm shuckling right now if you're looking at this video so you can see what it looks like. Some people shuckle front to back. 
Some people, which I also do, go side to side. Now, he says, with this strobe light, if everyone appears jerky, then pretty soon no one worries about how he or she looks. So when I, Rabbi Zalman, invited, oh, uh, whoever's speaking here, invited Zalman to lead our congregation in prayer for the weekend. This is the rabbi of the book that's on my um, video if you're watching instead of listening. The book, again, is called Davening, A Guide to Meaningful Jewish Prayer. So Rabbi Zalman goes to lead the congregation in prayer for the weekend. He had us rent an industrial strobe light. <laughs> now are you picturing this, a strobe light in your congregation? If Quote, if everyone moves like a chicken, then people won't be so self-conscious about how they look, and then they'll start moving more, end quote, he said. We need to bring our bodies with us when we pray. Okay, is this starting to make sense to you if you're still with me? Okay, so Re Rabbi Zalman reminded us that in matters of political lineage by which we are called to the Torah or otherwise identified as Cohen, Levi, or Israelite, and you're not going to understand this if you're Christian, unless you're maybe Messianic, you might understand the, the roles of each group of people in your congregation is subdivided by Cohen's, Levites, and Israel in a synagogue. So we give our names as the son or daughter of our fathers, but in matters of spiritual descent, by which we are traditionally reckoned as a Jew, or in matters of personal prayer, we give our names instead as son or daughter of our mothers. When we begin to speak with God, Zalman suggested that we identify ourselves as the children of our mothers, like a radio station announcing it, its call letters as it goes on the air. Zalman initiated the pre-Shabbat Kavana of reflecting one by one on the days of the week just gone by as a spiritual preparation for Kabbalat Shabbat. And Kavana, which is an essential ingredient of anybody's prayers, Jewish or not, it means intention. If you're doing your praying because there's some prayers you memorize, but you're feeling lifeless or putting yourself to sleep, you need to stir, like the Christian uh, Bible says, stir yourselves up in your most holy faith. So if you don't have Kavana, which is an essential ingredient in prayer, meaning intention, passion when you pray, then you have to ask God for it. God will increase your emuna if you ask for it. But you have to really want it. Just like God says in the Torah, if you desire God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and also there's a side note about loving your neighbor as yourself, then you can have these things. And they're things that we work on for the whole rest of our lives. Okay, but he said, find something in each day, he counseled, that you're glad to leave behind in the last week. That's what I was talking about at the beginning. If you're the, there's no transformation in your prayers when you go to a congregation, then you need to find out why. Okay, so the rabbi says, find something in each day that you're glad to leave behind in the last week, as well as something you'd like to bring with you into Shabbat. Now, this is for the people, especially the mindset of a Jew, or, you know, even a Christian, if they understand that Saturday is the Sabbath. What are you bringing to God on Shabbat? It is a very, very long list whether borrowing from the Catholics the idea of going away for a weekend retreat, which I've done many of those, using words or phrases in the Siddur as meditational mantras, like the Buddhas, or, of course, reappropriating the wearing of a big talit from the Orthodox and then adding the colors of the rainbow to it. And a talit is a, is a white, uh, like a cape with um, tzitzit, 
blue and white seat seat hanging from the tallit. Zalman Shachter Shalomi's fecund and seminal Torah is the mother load of a synergistic Judaism for the 21st century. Indeed, it would be hard today to find a community where prayer is alive that has not been influenced and inspired by Rabbi Zalman. Can you see now why he's one of my favorite rabbis? You are about to read a prescription written by, quote, the doctor of prayer, end quote. And I will stop that here, but encourage you to check out Rabbi Zalman's book. It's called Davening, A Guide to Meaningful Jewish Prayer. I hope this has at least, at least gotten you curious about the power of prayer and how the spirit within you, within us, is what causes us to move when we pray. Now, don't feel bad if you don't move, but please feel bad if you don't have any kavanah when you do pray. But that's something that can be fixed. You need to get the right ingredients. You can look up on Google, Google how, do I, how do I increase my faith? Um, and I would recommend that you look on um, sites for Judaism because Christians put their own spin on things and they're usually not true to Torah, unfortunately. But it's a stepping stone. I'm not knocking Christianity. I was once there and I'm seeking for the higher revelation and experience of God, which is possible. And perhaps if you're listening, this is what you're looking for too. I encourage you to get understanding. In the Proverbs, first we get wisdom. How? By asking for it. Get reading, of course. You know, it's not going to be a, a download from the heavens. You have to do the work. Get the right books by Jewish authors. Learn how to get wisdom, chokhmah. Learn how to get understanding. Learn how to get knowledge. Learn how to get... Uh, let's see, wisdom is with uh, prudence. That's the other one, prudence. I always think of the John Lennon song, Dear Prudence. I wonder if he knew <laughs> he was singing about a uh, spirit in the uh, book of Mishle, Proverbs. Okay, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Please share it with somebody else if you're trying to stir up some other people that you pray with that really you don't know how to say it in your own words. So share this podcast and don't forget to leave a good review because in this day and age with the saturation of musicians which I also am and as a new author uh, it, it's all about reviews and sharing liking posting subscribing all that happy stuff so I hope to see you again next Sunday at 11:30 a.m eastern time on youtube channel or on Instagram live. And let's see what we can go out with if I have a something about my book. Okay, let's try this. And thank you again for listening. Oh, that's not quite it. <laughs> oh, I was hoping I had something like automatically about my book, but maybe not. Try this one. We will be